trabajo. ¿no? Welcome everybody. We are uh, ready to start. Uh, the topic today is the impact of the European crisis on Latin America and East Central uh, Europe. Uh, we have a very distinguished panel that I will introduce uh, one by one, although they are very well known uh, already, of course. <coughs> um, so let me, let me just start by uh, giving some sort of background on, on this uh, session. Uh, why do we care about the impact of, of uh, the European crisis on emerging markets? Uh, uh, in principle, uh, the two regions could be somewhat separate and uh, have their own destinies. However, we know that uh, historically there's been a, quite a tight connection between what happens in the rest of the world uh, relative to the emerging markets and the emerging markets. So <laughs> it's an issue that one cannot uh, ignore. And besides, uh, when you look at the recent history, recent events, uh, the Lehman episode is a, quite a remarkable episode because uh, it sort of changed the view that uh, we had about emerging markets until the Lehman episode, even though the subprime crisis had started, uh, it took a bit of uh, many in the market again by surprise that the impact was so uh, so pronounced in that part of the world. Uh, even countries like Chile, that uh, is one of the examples of uh, conventionally at least, good macro policy was hit uh, pretty badly uh, during, during that crisis. Output fell by 2%, for example. So, um, so there is no question that one cannot ignore that. And also the lesson from Lehman that I take is that uh, uh, prior to a shock of that sort, it may very well be the case that emerging markets are doing quite well to the extent that if you remember prior to the Lehman episode, uh, people started to talk about decoupling of emerging markets. So this is a very treacherous terrain, it appears, where uh, you can never kind of relax. Uh, things are always, bad news are always lurking in, in, in the background. And that's why it's so important to have a panel of uh, this uh, stature to help us. Uh, here we have uh, academics and policy makers or uh, with a lot of experience in, this, in these issues. Uh, the, the first speaker will be uh, George Kopitz because uh, George, uh, his comparative advantage is on uh, emerging markets in, in Europe. So we start talking about Europe. Then we will move on to Latin America. Uh, Ernesto Talvi uh, will follow. Uh, and Domingo Cavallo, and then Carmen Reinhardt, uh, who will, I hope, show up uh, momentarily, will uh, uh, close the first part of the session. I will allow speakers about 15 minutes, so we have plenty of time for Q&A. Let me introduce George, he's an old friend. Uh, uh, we go back to our years at uh, the IMF. Um, he is presently senior scholar at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars and a member of Portugal's Public Finance Council. So he really where things are happening at this moment. And also a member of the Commission for Reform of the Macro Fiscal Framework in Peru. So he actually he covers both, both regions. Um, he, uh, prior to that, he was the first chair of a, a new fiscal council for the Republic of Hungary. Um, and uh, during 2004 and 2009, he was a member of the Monetary Council, National Bank of Hungary. 
Um, and uh, well, he has had different positions, teaching positions that I have time to go through. But um, he's also now the faculty at the Central European University. And he said it in a volume on restoring public debt sustainability, the role of independent fiscal institutions, which is uh, going to be published uh, next year. So I'm delighted to welcome George. Thank you, Guillermo. It's always a pleasure to come here, not only to see you and Sara, but also to be in this uh, environment where you deal with, with real-time issues in the policy area. And certainly, this is a hot one. Uh, let me uh, plunge right into Central and Eastern Europe without having to really go through geography. I'm sorry, I'm going to give you a presentation the old-fashioned way um, uh, without a PowerPoint. Uh, if I had a PowerPoint, I could show you countries and, and, uh, and uh, frontiers and, and all that sort of thing, perhaps even some history. But anyway, um, let me just start out by saying something that you could say about Latin America also, but it perhaps applies even more for this group of countries, and that is the diversity which one wouldn't have thought that would really shake out this way 20 years ago when the Iron Curtain fell. Because that's one thing that is in common in these countries that they, that they uh, uh, started out as, uh, again, part of, of Europe, as Middle Europa, as the, as the Germans called it way back, or others also in German. Um, and, and diversity is really the, the, uh, the first uh, uh, characteristic that comes to mind. In fact, three of these countries, Estonia, Slovakia, Slovenia, are uh, uh, part of the Eurozone already. Whereas there are other countries, if we stretch it to south, you know, like Serbia and Croatia, that are not even members yet of, of the uh, European Union. The rest are members of the European Union. And then there is the Czech Republic, and I'm sorry that we don't have Jan Sveina here today, which uh, a, I'm going to use perhaps something that has a nasty connotation, but pretends to be an advanced economy and makes sure that it's, it's classified outside <laughs> the, uh, the other group of countries. Um, and there are some historical reasons, but there is also the, the, the president of the country who feels that, hey, we are already an advanced uh, economy and felt that way 20 years ago as well. Um, uh, so you do, have, you do have a fair amount of diversity also in the policy framework, the attitude towards uh, the rest of Europe and the rest of the world. Um, and there is even a country that, for those of you who are more familiar with the, with the uh, 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 Latin American, a, a Latin American continent, if you wish, uh, which tries to emulate, in many respects, uh, a country that is close to our hearts, of course, Argentina. Uh, so that, uh, having said that, uh, let me, uh, an Argentine politics and policy making. Um, so that's not really good news, of course. But let me just go quickly, if I may, in, in 10, 15 minutes. But the channels, the vulnerabilities of these countries, the channels of transmission of the crisis, right? Uh, the vulnerabilities that you find in these countries, and then the euro crisis itself and how it's transmitted given the channels and the vulnerabilities and the, the saga that, that the eurozone is going through. And finally, if I may, but if not perhaps in this, but in the subsequent because we will have another uh, uh, chance, I suppose, to speak. We could talk about performance and outlook in these various countries. So I may sprinkle in some country examples, but I'm not going to give you uh, at each and every turn how different countries range in this, in this process. And of course, in the Q&A, I will try to respond to country specifics or whatever else uh, might uh, be in your minds. What are the channels? Well, the channels of transmission are the real side, the real channel, of course, through trade, foreign direct investment, and even migration, because this is really an open uh, 
and common economic uh, space that we are uh, talking about to a lesser or to a greater or lesser extent. Um, the financial channels, however, are really where the devil is lurking, and that's, that's where the, the, the problems, and of course, it's all, I mean, I'm just talking about the real versus the financial for convenience, for presentation or convenience, but it's all a ball of wax. On the financial, there is the obvious capital movements, right? Capital mobility in these countries, which, which uh, certainly serves as a transmission in this process. And that includes, of course, uh, the holdings of sovereign paper, as well as private bonds, equities. Um, but there is something that is particularly important, I would say pivotal, and which distinguishes this region from Latin America, or the Latin American, the impact of the Euro crisis onto Latin America or wherever else, else in the world, and that's bank ownership. Okay, bank ownership by EU banks. And uh, this, is, this is, this in some respects, could be considered the Achilles heel. Uh, uh, these countries are too close for comfort, particularly in a situation like this. So given those channels, well, what are the vulnerabilities? And some of the vulnerabilities are just environmental vulnerabilities, if you wish. Um, I'm not talking about environmental protection, but rather the, um, the economic environment, OK? And the structure of these countries the, on the real side. First of all, well, the high integration of these economies with Western Europe, with the major countries, um, which is phenomenal. In some countries, I mean, it just happened almost overnight in the Baltics, particularly Estonia. I mean, a, a very large percentage, certainly much more than, I would say about more than 50% of exports are towards uh, EU, other EU countries, but particularly, of course, the Eurozone countries here are Italy, Germany, uh, uh, England, and so forth. Large foreign direct investment, but also countries that, well, the other, the, the, I'm not, I didn't mean to just single out the Baltics alone. There are a number of countries that are very much integrated, again, through foreign direct investment as well. And the banking, of course, can be regarded as part of that foreign direct investment. On the, on the uh, and, and, and the more, of course, the exposure to EU exports, the more you're going to feel in these countries, whatever volcano erupts or whatever earthquake erupts, uh, you know, in terms of, of, of tremors. On the uh, financial side, the financing needs of these countries to a large extent, their, their credit expansion, which is perfectly fine. I mean, in a developing country, in a transition economy, as the economy develops, it will need, of course, the credit, the financial intermediation that goes with it. So much of it was not really a bubble a la Ireland or Spain or, or California or, or what have you, but it was really genuine financing needs by the public sector, by the private sector as well, and for trade purposes. Uh, um, in some countries, of course, the financing needs of the public sector uh, are quite significant. Uh, and that is the countries that have a high public uh, 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 debt to, to, to GDP. <clears throat> and then there are, there are weaknesses in the banking system itself. Always, by the way, keep in mind that the banking system, unlike in the US, the banking system really is the major channel of financial intermediation in Europe in general, but in these countries as well. So the non-bank financial sector doesn't really, uh, doesn't really play quite the same role as in the, as in the uh, uh, US. Uh, the external debt, well, uh, weaknesses of the banking uh, uh, system include also um, the fact that you have a fairly large uh, relatively speaking, fairly large uh, foreign currency denominated lending. Although Peru all of a sudden comes to my mind, there too there is a fair amount of it. But but in this, in some of these countries, including my uh, including uh, uh, my own native country, Hungary, um, it has gone through a form of original sin, if I may use that uh, journalistic expression, in this sense. A, but, a, and, and, and part of it has to do, I mean, in terms of causality, uh, started in Poland and in Hungary and a couple of other countries, 
with a rather uh, uh, strict monetary policy, or if you wish, or adequate, I wouldn't call it strict, but adequate monetary policy in the days when uh, we wanted to bring down uh, inflationary pressures. Balcerowicz, when he was the head of the, uh, of the National Bank of Poland, certainly he, 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 he uh, was among the more prudent central bankers. But what happened is that some of the credit that was not extended, foregone by the domestic currency financial intermediation, actually uh, happened through the uh, through, through, through foreign exchange denominated uh, uh, credits and lending, not just for mortgages, but also increasingly for short term credits. Now, as long as this was for euro purposes, uh, I mean, for uh, sorry, euro denominated paper, um, one could actually uh, uh, look at this as just, hey, getting to the first stage or the ante room of uh, joining the euro. Because once you join the euro, hell, all euro denominated, so there is no real risk uh, in in uh, in relying on this. Quite aside from well, weakening the impact of monetary policy in the process, but this is this this has been going on, and in Hungary, uh, unfortunately, it went on uh, while joining euro became more and more elusive uh, uh, in its uh, in 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 in, in, uh, in the recent years. Uh, so that, that uh, didn't quite happen. And the other thing is that it was not just euro denominated, uh, relatively low interest uh, euro denominated uh, 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 credits, but also Swiss franc credits. And that's a killer. That's really, that really makes you vulnerable. Because of course it had nothing to do with joining the, the, uh, the eurozone. Now some countries that had you a, lo a lot of exposure in terms of, of euro credits, join the euro, no problem. Slovakia, Estonia, and even to some extent, uh, Slovenia. Um, uh, so that, in fact, is, a, is an important vulnerability. Uh, the fiscal, of course, is a vulnerability for a number of countries. It continues to be that way. Um, Hungary, uh, with 80% uh, of GDP public debt, uh, then uh, bunch of other countries in the 40, 50 percent uh, range, um, but the very uh, conduct. And then there are the, 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 uh, the, the good ones, uh, Bulgaria, Estonia, uh, the Czech Republic, uh, uh, Slovakia with very low debt to GDP ratios. Uh, but what's important here is not just the debt to GDP ratio or the indebtedness, but also the conduct of fiscal policy uh, has not been predictable. Unlike monetary policy, which fairly early on became rather prudent, uh, starting in the late 90s, uh, most of these countries, those that are not in the Eurozone, uh, uh, have an inflation uh, targeting uh, regime, uh, which is followed fairly uh, uh, well. Uh, and then there are some others that uh, continue to rely year after year on a fixed exchange rate, such as Bulgaria, um, Estonia did uh, that until joining the Eurozone. Now it has really a logged exchange rate because it's part of the Eurozone. Um, and then uh, uh, we have to look at the policy elements. Well, I already mentioned the fiscal, but there are policy elements in this vulnerability, actually homemade type of, of vulnerabilities, which has to do with, with the attitude toward uh, uh, for investment, the policy uncertainty, and certainly what all of this leads to is a limited policy space. Okay, so there isn't much room there uh, to uh, pursue, for example, a fiscal monetary uh, type of, of stimulus in most of these countries, I would say all of them. So what about the euro crisis, the impact of the euro crisis under these conditions? Well, obviously, if uh, uh, in Italy and Germany, import demand is not what it used to be, and there is a slack, uh, then that's going to be felt. It has been felt, and that's going to uh, uh, show up in, in low growth, low growth in the country where there is of course, which, which uh, uh, um, uh, determines this low or, or slack in import demand and low growth than in the exporting countries, which are so, so open and integrated to, to, uh, to these economies. Um, 
but really the 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 uh, the important area really uh, where much of the damage is being done is bank deleveraging bank deleveraging in the eurozone countries and it's a bank deleveraging that has a home bias okay so uh, even the regulators or through moral suasion by the government they are reminded look you buy uh, uh, first of all of course you want to fulfill uh, Basel III as soon as possible, as soon as possible, meaning within the next few years. And at the same time, though, um, you're going to buy, if you're a Spanish bank, Spanish bonds. If you're, if you're a French bank, French uh, paper, and so forth. So as, in fact, a balance sheets by, uh, by Eurozone banks are repaired, uh, they tend to shed a, a, a assets in uh, a East Central Europe. So that's, that's bad news for this for these, uh, region. The negative spillovers are rather obvious in this, in this sense. Now you might say, and this is a perverse sort of outcome and it's not too visible, a, non-banks and hedge funds and even some real money uh, investors uh, um, in uh, uh, the Eurozone, but more in, in uh, say, in, in the US, uh, where they are slushing with liquidity. Uh, there is liquidity slushing around, uh, and they do have some appetite for risk. Uh, they'll be very happy to, to buy some Hungarian paper. So there is sort of a substitution between bona fide investors or banks with this, uh, uh, this type of, of activity because, you know, when you get a 5 6% uh, interest rate, I mean, the risk premium is rather high for countries like uh, Croatia and Hungary and, and, and so forth, but it's better even getting into Hungary because it's part of the EU. EU is really the collateral, is the soybeans, if you wish, of Hungary, if I may make that, that uh, uh, metaphor comparison with uh, with Argentina and other uh, countries that have uh, uh, um, a collateral in form of primary commodities. All in all, all of this has led to a considerable credit cr crunch in these countries to a larger or greater extent. In some, some countries have been affected more, others less, but um, uh, credit has been still increasing somewhat in, in, in Poland. And, but Bulgaria has been badly affected, Romania, Hungary, uh, by, by this uh, de deleveraging. And of course, all of that has very important uh, uh, repercussions in the real sector because it affects investment and growth in these in this, uh, uh, economies. Now, some of this has been compensated by the so-called Vienna initiatives, one in, after Lehman Brothers in uh, Meltdown in early 2009, another one earlier this year, Vienna initiatives, where you bring together uh, uh, regulatory authorities and, and major banks with, uh, from Europe, with, with, from Western Europe, with those of Central Eastern uh, European countries, to see how they can really uh, 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 temper these, these, uh, uh, the effect of the, the leveraging towards their, uh, their bank branches and, and subsidiaries uh, in these locations. Um, about the performance, well, there are a few countries, believe it or not, that are growing. Uh, and uh, that is the, the, the uh, well, those are the Baltic countries after a huge, but huge contraction, I mean, in the double digits. Uh, GDP, uh, 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 not growth, but contraction uh, has been violent. Uh, and we could get into some of the uh, reasons, Estonia, for example, but they are growing really nicely right now. Uh, Poland has been growing throughout this whole uh, saga, uh, albeit 2%, which is, of course, lower than its potential of 4% or so. Uh, but a number of countries are getting hit rather uh, hard. And, and investment is down. There are some discrete investment episodes that are taking place, but they're more uh, really uh, isolated. I think I'm going to leave the outlook until next round. Is that OK? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, George. Um,
The next speaker uh, will be Ernesto Talvi. Uh, many of you, of you uh, know Ernesto, or will get to know Ernesto. I'm talking about the PPM students in particular because Ernesto is going to be teaching uh, macro with me uh, next semester. Uh, now, Ernesto is a senior fellow and director of the Latin American Initiative at the Brookings Institution, and he's the academic director of the Center for Study of Economic and Social Affairs in Montevideo, Uruguay. Um, so, um, Ernesto. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Guillermo, for the invitation. Uh, thank you very much, David, for your pers professionality and unbelievable hospitality, as usual. Everything is perfectly well organized. Uh, um, I am very happy to be here since I, I had the privilege to be visiting professor at, at Columbia during the spring semester of this year. So it's like uh, a little bit like coming back home. And um, well, I'm, 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 I'm going to be focusing uh, more on Latin America since we don't have a lot of time, but maybe we'll get into some of the aspects that have to do with Europe the Euro crisis per se on the Q&A session. And essentially, I'm going to be making uh, three, three points. Um, the first point that I would like to make is, um, and by the way, uh, everything I'm going to say, it's uh, contained, and, and a lot of things I'm not going to say are contained in a, in a Brookings series, uh, uh, Latin American, uh, Outlook uh, report from a global perspective. It also has an analysis on Europe and the US that we wrote together with two of my colleagues, uh, one at Ceres, Ignacio Munjo, and, and Diego Perez, who used to be at Ceres, and it's now a Stanford PhD student at Stanford. So the, the, first, the first point I would like to make is that a new global economic geography has emerged in the aftermath of the financial crisis where economic mi vitality migrated from advanced economies to uh, a subset, and we'll see specifically what subset of emerging countries. And if we start looking at where all, st at, at, at where all started, the US, what we see there is that after the onset of the financial crisis, there was a very, very severe credit crunch in Guillermo's uh, terminology, this would be like a domestic sudden stop. And uh, this sudden stop in, in, in the flows of credit were associated, and you can see that on the right hand side, uh, with a very, very dramatic uh, decline and persistent decline in GDP. In fact, uh, economic activity is still today around 9% below what it would have been had the trends prevailing prior to the crisis continued. Um, in fact, this has been the most anemic recovery since the Second World War, although this should not come as a surprise for those of us who have been uh, dedicating our lives to understanding um, financial crisis. I mean, um, all the recoveries uh, from financial crisis tend to be anemic when compared to the prevailing trends prior to the crisis. Now, if we look at the rest of the advanced economies, what we see is essentially the same picture. A severe contraction in credit flows in Japan, in the European Union, that came associated with a very severe and also persistent decline in economic activity, which both in Japan and in the European Union still lie substantially below the trends that were prevailing prior to the crisis. Now, one would have thought that ex ante that if 
uh, we were asked the question, look, 65% of the world economy is going to enter into a severe and persistent recession. What would happen with emerging economies? And we would all have probably answered that, well, they are also going to enter into a severe and persistent recession. Nonetheless, that's not exactly what happened. And we will try to understand why. And if we look at emerging economies, and the largest of all, and we'd be given by the largest of all, China, what we saw in the immediate aftermath of the financial crisis was a very dramatic increase in bank credit. Exactly flows, exactly the opposite of what happened in advanced economies. And in fact, this boom in credit fueled the boom in domestic demand that was large enough to compensate for the substantial decline in exports that China had to a point that actually uh, economic activity was running, is running, and still running in spite of the cooling off uh, above pre-crisis trends. Now, if we look at emerging Europe, and we look at the largest economy in emerging Europe, which is Russia, we actually see a very different picture. We actually see a pattern that is very similar to the one that we saw for advanced economies. A very persistent and severe decline, and in fact, Russia's GDP is still 14% below pre-crisis trends. So uh, we have these diverging fortunes in, 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 in the emerging world. And if we were to look at Latin America, we also see diverging fortunes. If we look at Brazil, in spite of the recent cooling off of the economy, uh, Brazil is still, uh, GDP is still running above its pre-crisis trends. Because again, a booming credit, a booming domestic demand, that actually compensated for the decline in exports. Now, if we look at Mexico, in spite of the recent uh, pickup in the growth rates, what we see is a pattern that is very similar to advanced economies. A severe and persistent decline, and actually Mexico's GDP is still close to 11% below its pre-crisis trends. Now, uh, since we have this very a uh, peculiar uh, fact that uh, a crisis that crippled the advanced economies, which represents 65% of world GDP, actually left both winners and losers in the emerging world. We, want to first, we wanted to first document in a very generalized and precise way this phenomenon and then to try to understand why this actually happened, why we had winners and why we had losers. And in order to document the phenomenon in a more general way, essentially we created a post-financial crisis global index of economic performance, which essentially me measures for advanced economies and all the emerging regions for a group of six macro variables, whether the economy is performing better than what would have been suggested by pre-crisis trends or performing worse than what would have been suggested by pre-crisis trends. And we normalize these index to uh, range from minus 100 to plus 100. So a positive number would mean that you are performing better than what would have been suggested but by pre-crisis trends. And um, the more positive, the better. And a negative number means that you are performing worse than what's suggested by pre-crisis trends, and the more negative, the worse. And this is what we obtain. Essentially, the negative numbers appear, not surprisingly, in advanced economies and in economies in emerging Europe and Mexico and Central American region that are tightly connected to advanced economies. And the positive numbers, i.e. the countries and regions that are performing better than what would have been suggested by pre-crisis trends in the aftermath of the global financial crisis are essentially located in South America, Sub-Saharan Africa, emerging Asia, and to a lesser extent in the Middle East and Africa. 
In fact, if we look at individual countries, nine out of the first 15 uh, strong performers in the aftermath of the global crisis are Latin American countries. So Latin American countries are highly overrepresented in the uh, uh, um, uh, good performers in the aftermath of the crisis. So just to close up the first point, what we see is in the aftermath of the global crisis, of the onset of the global crisis, a migration from, uh, of economic vitality from essentially advanced economies and emerging economies tightly connected to them to a subset of emerging economies essentially located in emerging Asia, South America, and Sub-Saharan Africa. So the second point that we would like uh, to make is, and is to try to understand why there were winners and losers in the emerging world, and uh, in particular in Latin America. And therefore, we have to deal, dig a, dip, a little bit further into the key features of the new global economic geography. And if we start by the upper left-hand side, we can see that the onset of the global financial crisis was associated with a very low world interest rate environment, very low risk premium environment, and with that humongous increase in capital inflows towards emerging economies. In fact, it is a subset of emerging economies. Here I'm showing you the inflows to Latin America. They tripled in the aftermath of the global financial crisis. Actually, uh, to buy land, to buy property, to buy companies, to buy bonds, to buy stocks, creating, in many, many cases, an asset boom, a credit boom, a domestic demand boom and acce an acceleration in growth. So I think this is the key connection between uh, the crisis in the North and the vitality and exuberance that we are seeing in a subset of countries, in emerging countries. That uh, the depression uh, that we saw or the collapse in consumption and investment and the corresponding rise in saving rates, freed up capital and financial resources that were uh, made available at very cheap rates uh, uh, for uh, uh, a subset of emerging markets. But that was not the only key characteristics of, of the new geography post-financial crisis. The migration of vitality towards uh, the periphery or the emerging economies created a change in the composition of world demand towards primary commodities that are essentially what most of Latin America produces and exports. And in fact, in the midst of the worst uh, post-World War II uh, recession in the advanced world, we saw commodity prices actually hit record highs rather than seeing depressed uh, prices. And that's the third characteristic, very high commodity prices. And the fourth is a, a sharp slowdown in the remittances from advanced economies to emerging economies. So who, if these are the key characteristics of the new global economic geography, who are the likely winners in this new geography? And well, the likely winners are those countries that are net commodity exporters and therefore are likely to benefit from very high commodity prices. And there, just focusing on Latin America, we see a sharp contrast between the <coughs> net commodity exporting South America and an essentially net commodity importing Mexico and Central America region. The second is that those countries that are tightly connected, connected to the now new centers of economic vitality, i.e. emerging countries or a subset of emerging countries, will be uh, benefited from this new geography. And in fact, we see again a very sharp contrast between South America and Mexico and Central America. South America being much more connected to the now uh, 
vital regions of the emerging world, while Mexico and Central America are very tightly connected to the anemic advanced economies, in particular the US. Third, uh, remittances. We see again a sharp contrast between the Mexico and Central America region, very tightly, very dependent on remittances, while the South American region has a very low dependence on remittances originating essentially from the US. And finally, and I think most importantly, it's how integrated to global capital markets these two regions are. Because the more integrated you are, the more uh, you stand to benefit from the availability of abundant and cheap capital and financial resources. And in fact, with the exception of Mexico, which has levels of integrations to the global capital market that are as large as those that we see in most of the South American countries, Central, the Central America region has very low levels of integration to global capital markets. So when we group together, according to their structural characteristics, the countries that we would identify as likely winners in the new global e economic geography, those that are commodity exporters tightly linked to the dynamic parts of the economic world, uh, of, the, of, of, of the world economy, that have a low dependence on remittances, that are highly integrated to the global capital markets, uh, to, and, and group together those that have the, the other characteristics, the opposite characteristics. What we see is that the performance of these two groups differed very dramatically during the Lehman crisis. In fact, the, the, those that have structural characteristics that, that make them stand to benefit from the new global geography perform more, much better during the Lehman crisis and are expected to grow at larger, uh, the stronger rates in the foreseeable future according to consensus forecast, while those countries with structural characteristics that made them bound to be losers in the new global geography were hit much harder during the Lehman crisis and are expected to grow at lower rates. When you see the growth rates pre global crisis of these two groups, they were very similar. So, event, so, so the, the global financial crisis created a rift in the, in the, in the, in the, in the emerging market world uh, that actually divided it into potential winners and potential losers uh, due to the interaction between the key characteristics of the new global ge economic geography post-global financial crisis and the structural characteristics of the countries. And in fact, capital movements or capital flows took good notice of this because when we group what happened with capital flows to these two groups of countries, to the likely winners, actually capital inflows are today larger than they were prior to the onset of the financial crisis, and they have declined very dramatically to the countries that we have identified according to their structural characteristics as likely losers. And this is a very, very important aspect. I mean, they, the, the, the capital inflows, the, what we think of as the financial and capital resources that were freed up by the recession in the advanced economies did not flow indiscriminately to all the emerging economies, but only to those that given the new geography, the, the, the new characteristics of the global geography and their structural characteristics were uh, identified or expected to be likely winners. So, and this is the last point I'm going to make. Uh, paradoxically, it is the more dynamic economies that are now more vulnerable to episodes of global financial turmoil. And this is where the connection with the European crisis comes in. I'm not going to talk about the European crisis per se. And that can, we can talk about in the Q&A session if we want. But if something were to go astray in Europe that can, could create a Lehman-type moment or a turmoil that would stop 
the reallocation of capital from northern countries to the emerging economies that the subset of emerging economies that became like the engine of world growth, then that would have very dire consequences for everyone, but very specifically to the dynamic economies. And we can show a mini example of that already happening. So let us look at what happened when global conditions started to deteriorate April, May 2011, and that was the time when the Euro crisis started to generalize from the smaller countries, Greece, Portugal, Ireland, into Spain and Italy. What we saw then was a relatively large uh, increase in the risk premia for emerging markets, a relatively important decline in commodity prices, and a very substantial reduction in growth forecasts for advanced economies. In fact, uh, the cooling off in China actually started when the European, the Eurozone crisis started to deteriorate and to generalize to the uh, big countries like Spain and Italy. So we then went and analyzed which were the economies that were the worst hit during the second semester of 2011 at the height of this turmoil, mini turmoil, because this was qualitatively very similar to Lehman, but quantitatively much smaller. And what we saw is that the growth decelerations or reductions were very, very severe in the countries that we identified as likely winners in the new global geography, and uh, as di therefore as dynamic, while the economies that we identified as anemic actually accelerated a little bit their growth rates in the second semester of 2011, and the same thing, and to a larger degree, we saw it in Latin America. It was the countries that were growing at the highest rates that are countries like Argentina, like Brazil, that was growing at 7.5%, Peru, that's actually suffered the most severe decelerations, while the other countries actually uh, did not only did not decelerate, but actually accelerated a little bit their, their growth rates. So just to finish, uh, I like to always quote Oscar Wilde, uh, the formidable Irish playwright, uh, truth is rarely pure and never simple, and this is the complex world that we live in. And the normal conditions, and by normal conditions we define a situation in which we can have occasional bouts of financial turmoil, but that they do not develop into a full-blown panic. And the normal conditions, it is the countries that we identified as dynamic and beneficiaries of the new global economic geography, those that are expected to do well in the foreseeable future. But it is precisely those countries that are the beneficiaries of these very large inflows of capital where asset and credit booms are actually happening, where domestic demand is booming, where growth is accelerating, that are bound to be hit the worst if this circuit of inflows of capital suddenly stops because there is a, 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 a turmoil that uh, induces this capital to, to, to shy away from the emerging world and go into back into the safe havens. Uh, and this is uh, an important trait of that, I think both the international community and policymakers, very especially in the very dynamic economies, should be very aware of when they set uh, their policies. And again, this is something hopefully we can discuss uh, during the Q&A session. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Ernesto. You really have illustrated in a very uh, clear way uh, that we are traveling in um, very treacherous water. It's very hard to extrapolate and to become complacent. Now, the next speaker is uh, Domingo Felipe Cavallo, who is now a senior fellow at the Jackson Institute for Global Affairs at Yale University. Uh, he's a chairman of a consultancy, uh, honorary president of the Fundación Mediterránea. He's a member of the Group of 30, and uh, he's obviously very well known by um, uh, having been uh, the Minister of Economy in Argentina from 1991 to 1996, and then again in 2001, a period where uh, an experiment not much different from some of the experiments that we see in Europe nowadays, which is a fixed exchange rate vis-a-vis -vis a reserve currency uh, took place. Uh, prior to that, he was the Minister of Foreign Affairs in Argentina from 89 to 91. He was a congressman and uh, was also the chairman of the Central Bank of, of Argentina. So I could uh, go on and on singing his praises, but uh, we'd like to hear Domingo. Okay, please. For the invitation, Guillermo, and uh, it's an honor to participate in in this panel with such good and uh, and experienced and uh, smart uh, uh, partners. So uh, I want to apologize because I didn't bring a tie, not a jacket, <laughs> because you know coming into New York it was an adventure for me. I was in in Cartagena de Indias, in Colombia, exactly that, and I was supposed to come to New York and then to New Haven, um, and then from there to Washington, uh, the night of the Sunday. Of course, the flights were canceled, and uh, to reach New Haven, I had to, to go around for several days, uh, uh, and, and I could not go to Washington, and there is where I have my formal suits. So <laughs> I had to come with the same uh, clothes that I was using in, in Cartagena de Indias. So my apologies. Uh, of course, I have not prepared my presentation. So that is why I am very happy uh, to follow the very clear uh, presentation by Ernesto Talvi. Uh, I, I have not prepared it, not because I consider this is not uh, an important, uh, but ex because uh, I am teaching two courses at, at Yale, and with the suspension of, of classes last uh, week, uh, I had an accumulation of responsibility this week, <laughs> so uh, I, I will improvise. But uh, I think th to complement what Ernesto Talvi just uh, described very eloquently and very clearly, uh, I want to refer a bit to Europe, how I see the possible evolution of the situation in Europe and how uh, uh, the events in Europe may affect uh, Latin American uh, economies depending on how they really um, uh, evolve. Um, in, in respect to Latin America, just to, to make a comment to what uh, Ernesto Talvi described, um, I must uh, make it clear that in South America, you have also to differentiate between uh, those economies that are well managed from a macroeconomic point of view, fiscal and monetary policies, like fortunately, most of them, uh, including Brazil, I think, but for, of course, Chile, Peru, uh, Colombia, 
and then uh, Uruguay, uh, even Paraguay, and then you, you have uh, the two outliers, which are Venezuela and uh, Argentina. I do not include Ecuador because thanks to the dollarization, Ecuador somehow has some uh, more consistent macro policies than Argentina and, and Venezuela. So the problems in Argentina and Venezuela, uh, of course, uh, have some connection with what is going on in the rest of the world, uh, particularly with the price of, of commodities, oil for Venezuela, soy for for Argentina, and whatever it, uh, happens with these two grip prices will for sure uh, affect uh, Venezuela and Argentina. But all the other problems that we have in these two economies are completely homemade problems and relate to the uh, awful fiscal and uh, monetary management and all the uh, regulations and inter crazy interventions uh, in the markets in these two economies. So probably everything that Ernesto Talvi said uh, applies to this subset of uh, South American countries which really are managed uh, in a relatively serious way, I mean, uh, macro management, no? Uh, and I would s completely set aside Venezuela and Argentina because to analyze them, we have to look at completely different um, aspects. No? Now, in connection to Europe or in relation to Europe, uh, I have, I think that there may be two possible evolutions of the situation. One evolution would be to have a, a significantly weakened euro, let's say uh, that finally the ECB implements a monetary policy like that of the Fed and, and, and the euro may be uh, weakens to one to one or close to one dollar per per euro, uh, in which case, of course, um, the recession, if it happens, or uh, the, it will not be that large, uh, and there may be a, a recovery, a slow recovery, like that one that we are observing in the US, but not a catastrophe. Um, like the one that could happen uh, if the evolution of monetary policy and other policies in, in, in uh, Europe are uh, very different. Uh, I am not simply uh, considering that, that uh, what happens with, with Greece is the key to predict what will happen uh, with European policies. Be some people say, look, if um, Europe uh, decides that, uh, or uh, Greece, or a combination of Europe and Greece decide that Greece should exit the, the euro and default on its debt uh, by converting all its debt from uh, euros into dragmas, and then letting the dragman, of course, to uh, experience a large devaluation, like the devaluation of the peso uh, in 2002 after converting uh, assets and liabilities that were denominated in dollars into peso one to one and then letting the peso to, uh, to flow. If that happens, some people say that is by itself the disaster of, of Europe. Uh, I think that Europe should avoid this event in Greece. I think it would, have, it would be a mistake uh, for Europe to let uh, Greece to exit the euro and, and to default. But it will be a, the same mistake that the US made by letting uh, Lehman Brothers uh, go bankrupt. I think if that happens in, 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 uh, in in Greece, the day after, the ECB and even Germany and, and Europe will behave exactly as the US uh, government, Treasury, and, and Fed behaved after the Lehman Brothers 
glasses because they will be they they will not be in a position to afford a collapse of uh, Spain, uh, Portugal, Ireland, Italy, which for sure would come if this ECB and and, and Germany continues uh, behaving like uh, they have been behaving until uh, six months uh, ago. Of course, I think that the best course of action for uh, Europe, for European uh, governments and for the European uh, uh, Central Bank would be um, uh, to learn from the experience of Lehman Brothers uh, in the United States and, and try to implement the kind of policies even with lower cost than otherwise that were implemented in the US in order to prevent uh, going into a great uh, depression and a deflation and all the uh, other complications. Now, of course, it is not only a question of uh, relaxing uh, monetary policies by the ECB and having the ECB acting as a lender of last resource, not only of the banking system, but also of, of the countries. Um, it's also a question of looking for orderly ways to deal with the uh, debt uh, overhang of, uh, in Europe. Uh, of course, the ex ex excessive indebtedness and the situations of, of insolvencies of many financial institutions and, and many uh, 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 firms, uh, uh, and, and of course, treasuries in, uh, in Europe has to be uh, solved. But there are two ways of solving it. In orderly ways, uh, of course, not it is not very simple, but I think uh, there can be orderly ways to do it. And somehow uh, we have the example of Greece itself that negotiating with its uh, private creditor was able to to reduce the cost of servicing uh, the debt with the public creditor to just 0.6% uh, of GDP over the next uh, four or five years. Um, and, and I think, for example, in the case of Spain, um, that has a, a group of banks, particularly the so-called cajas de ahorro, or the banks that were created based on the cajas de ahorro, that the best way to, to cope with their debt problem would be to resolve those, those institutions, uh, to have the creditors that are not uh, guaranteed, uh, you know, to take a significant uh, loss, maybe by offering them the alternative of capitalizing their credits and increasing the, the capital of this institution, but not by European money or by uh, money uh, of the uh, um, uh, Spanish government, but uh, through a process of uh, restructuring of, of the debt of those institutions. And otherwise, Spain will run in the same problem as uh, uh, Ireland. Uh, 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 went uh, through by trying to just absorb by the public sector the all the debts and the responsibilities of the of the banks but a, a, a monetary policy by the ECB closer to that of the Fed a, a weakening of the euro let's say to one to one or close to one to one to the uh, to the dollar in an orderly process of debt uh, restructuring and absorption of losses by the various uh, creditors and, and participants in the, uh, in the financial markets um, will provide a solution which would allow maybe uh, go through only a short and not very deep recession and then a recovery. A recovery that will be very slow, like it is in the United States, for the same reason that is slow in the United States. But there will be no uh, there will be no disaster. If that is the evolution of Europe, I think the impact in Latin America will be very similar to what to the impact that uh, 
Ernesto just described for the crisis in the uh, United States. Probably with more liquidity in euros uh, uh, injected by the ECB, you will have uh, the same uh, and, and, the, and the climate and the, of recession in, in Europe, you will have uh, uh, again more capital available for, uh, uh, for Latin American countries. Um, uh, of course, that additional capital that could come to a Latin American country may create bubbles, and that is also a problem for, for the future. Um, uh, but I think uh, uh, we should not expect uh, terrible uh, eff negative effects on Latin America in such a scenario. Now, there is an alternative scenario, which, of course, it would be a disaster much bigger than the one of the um, subprime mortgage crisis and then the, the, the global crisis that emerged from uh, the events in the US in 2008. And that would be the disintegration of, uh, of the euro. If um, the decision or, or the political dynamics in Europe would bring into a sort of disintegration of the, the eurozone, a disintegration through exit, having first an exit of, of uh, an, an exit and a default, because exiting the euro means defaulting on the debt. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, otherwise, imagine if you exit the euro and you keep all your debt denominated in, in euros, uh, imagine what the uh, uh, original sin uh, you, you will face in, the, in that country. And also, uh, when I mean exiting the euro, I mean at the same time defaulting through a very peculiar way of defaulting, converting all the obligations in, into the local currency, the newly introduced local currency, and letting that uh, currency to, uh, to devalue uh, extremely. But if that is done not only by Greece, but then by Portugal, by Ireland, by Spain, and by Italy, which very likely, if the ECB and the, the other government do not uh, intervene to prevent that, that is what will happen. That will be a terrible disaster, not only for Europe, but for the world. Because Europe will go into a great recession, but the world will go into a, a, a depression. It will have a, a impact on Asia also, because China is an important supplier of goods uh, to, uh, to Europe. Of course, it will impact uh, the US, that has a close trade connection with Europe. The trade within Europe will, will collapse. And you know, uh, in global trade, trade intra-European trade is a significant uh, amount. So I think the, the crisis, the global crisis through commercial channels would be much bigger and much deeper than the one that came after the, the crisis of 2008 uh, in the United States. So I think um, the impact on all over the world, in particular, even on Latin America, because um, I think that it would have had, in that case, probably China would have, uh, would suffer a severe uh, slowdown and that will affect the price of, of commodities and then through that channel of uh, prices of commodity will affect uh, uh, even a commodity exporters country like those of uh, South America. But uh, of course, uh, the consequences will be very bad for uh, for everybody. It, in my view, with a crisis in Europe, it will be very difficult to think of a situation of decoupling uh, of the rest of the of some group of emerging economy as it happened after the crisis in, in the United States. Because of the much more important role of trade with, within Europe and with uh, the rest of, of the world. And, and of course, because also the instruments that the emerging world has to try to dampen the effect by expanding the domestic uh, uh, economies uh, in a comp compensatory way, 
uh, are not so big uh, at this moment as they were at the moment of the global recession of 2008. So we, we should uh, uh, pray for uh, Europe to avoid this catastrophic uh, scenario. Otherwise, I think it will be very bad, not only for Latin America, but uh, for everybody. And probably less for Latin America than for other regions of, of the world, of course. The first possible evolution I mentioned would be very good for Eastern Europe, because if Eastern Europe is indebted in euros, then a weakening of the euro and a more uh, um, expansionary fiscal monetary policy by the ECB in line with the kind of monetary policy of the Fed, I think will help, um, uh, in a sense, uh, Eastern Europe. Now, the other uh, scenario is also is terrible for uh, Eastern Europe uh, for the same reason like the crisis in the US was terrible for Mexico in 2009, no? Uh, but even more for uh, Eastern Europe. Now, uh, um, uh, a last uh, comment uh, on, on this. Uh, I think in, in Europe, in, in my opinion, there, are, there is a wrong discussion, or particularly in Germany, about if the taxpayer, the Germans taxpayer will have to pay or not the, uh, the consequences of the excessive expending, excessive borrowing of Greece, Spain, and, and the other countries. But, you know, there is no way as uh, Germany can avoid uh, paying a significant part of the cost of this catastrophe, simply because they accumulated uh, uh, surpluses, they are the creditors of most of the institutions and, and companies and, and governments that uh, are excessively indebted. So either way, because they contribute to an orderly uh, process of debt restructuring and an orderly um, recovery of the, of the economy, uh, or simply because they suffer the consequence of a generalized default that will affect, of course, uh, uh, Germany much more than any other uh, country. So uh, Germany will have to pay a significant uh, cost. No? So uh, I think that uh, the best court course of action, and probably uh, when once uh, political difficulties are uh, uh, overcome, uh, of course, democratic processes do not allow uh, politicians to, to do, uh, to adopt decisions without looking at the political cycle. And, and that is what I think is happening in Germany these days. But once these problems are uh, overcome, I think that, Germ that uh, Europe will follow a, a path not very different from the one that the US followed uh, to, to cope with the, uh, with the crisis that started with the subprime uh, mortgage uh, collapse. So. Thank you very much. Uh, so now we come to the last speaker, okay. Carmen Reichert, uh, who is a, a Minos Banakis Professor of International Financial Systems at uh, Harvard Kennedy School. Uh, previously a uh, senior fellow at the Peterson Institute in, in Washington, D.C. And prior to that, professor of economics at the University of Maryland. And uh, she's been uh, um, working at the IMF for a number, for a number of years and also in, in the private sector. And, uh, so I'm delighted to welcome her, Carmen. Well, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, Domingo came from Cartagena. I came from Midtown. But it probably took me just as long to get here. <laughs> um, uh, so 
I, I apologize, I wasn't here for to hear your remarks. I will draw uh, on the comments made by uh, both er Ernesto and Domingo. Many of their views I share, and given that I have this, it, I'm one of these people that if given the option of the glass is half full or half empty, I'm the half empty kind of person. So uh, I will highlight, I think, some of the uh, risks um, that perhaps uh, Latin America faces that we we haven't heard from uh, as much as I would like. So let me divide my remarks into four parts. Uh, the first part is a little bit backward looking and it's not meant to be a history of the current crisis, but just to highlight a couple of features that are with us today that are relevant for not just the here and now, but also where we're going. The second part of my talk will focus on the advanced economies uh, and deal with the implications for emerging markets in the third part of my talk. And then in the final comments, I will try to uh, address some issues that I see as global in scope affecting both North and South in terms of changes in the global financial architecture. Uh, as we know it. So that's my roadmap. Let me start with the antecedents of the crisis. This advanced economy crisis, like many, many crises before it, takes root in an environment in which the advanced economies had very much liberalized their financial systems. You had a lot of financial innovation, securitization of debt, ample liquidity, but in this boom environment in which everyone is a genius and asset prices are booming, debt is also being rapidly accumulating. And the advanced economies that are today mired in the deepest crises are not surprisingly many very much share a common feature that those countries had enormous debt buildups prior to the crisis. And I'm not talking about public debt. I am talking about public plus private, because Domingo rightfully pointed, Greece and Italy perhaps, one can clearly point to a public debt problem, but Ireland and Spain are very much like the Chile of the early 1980s. Maybe some of you have read Diaz Alejandro's Goodbye Financial Repression, Hello Financial Crash. And in that work, what Diaz Alejandro describes is Chile in the early 80s uh, who had liberalized its financial markets. However, the government was virtuous. It was running surpluses. It didn't have much government debt. But the private sector was borrowing right, left, and center. Uh, and those debts were ultimately contingent liabilities of the government. And that is what we see today in Spain, and that's what we've seen in Ireland, and let us not forget the United States. In the United States, Fannie and Freddie, the two mortgage giants, were before the crisis were in the private sector balance sheet. And then after the crisis, those debts were transferred to the public sector balance sheet, 25 percentage points of GDP. So what is the picture in the run-up to 2007? The picture in the run-up of 2007 is the advanced economies in varying degrees are leveraging up sharply. The emerging markets, and on the other hand, especially emerging markets in Latin America and Asia that had severe crises in the 1990s were deleveraging we're deleveraging. This is something to remember because it has to do also about the issues that Ernesto raised and why we had countries that have been very resilient to the big uh, financial and real shock we had in 2008, 2009. So the advanced economies were leveraging up. The emerging markets in Eastern Europe were leveraging up. But Asia and Latin America on the whole having been swept away by crises, the Mexican crisis in 94, 95, the Asian crisis in 97, 98, Russia in 98, Brazil in 99, Argentina in 2001, Uruguay in 2002, we had a lot of crises in emerging markets. And the consequence was that when 
the global phenomenon that we have not seen since the 1930s, that is a major systemic crisis in the advanced world, hits, these countries were in a very strong, lean and mean position to withstand it. The, I'm gonna come back to this issue because this is relevant for dealing with the second part of my talk, which is where are we today and where are we going, in, first in the advanced economies and then in the emerging markets. Well, in the advanced economies, we are dealing with the legacy of the debt buildup. And that legacy uh, is now translated into, I follow, I track time series going back as far as I can, some of the series spanning hundreds, not decades. And I have not seen a debt buildup of this order of magnitude and of this variety. It's public debt, it's private debt, it's domestic debt, it's external debt. And that debt overhang that we have right now in the advanced economies needs a resolution. And here I am uh, of the view that if the advanced economies are having an emerging market crisis, why don't we look a little bit at ad advanced economies learning this time from emerging market crisis resolution? What am I getting at? I'm not, I, I, I love the Oscar Wilde quote that Ernesto put up that the truth is uh, uh, never pure and seldom s simple or the other way around. Uh, I am going to argue that it is improbable that the advanced economies will get out of this crisis without restructuring. Now, this doesn't mean that everyone becomes Greece, okay? Greek debts are essentially public debts and significant haircuts are needed to restore debt sustainability unless Greece becomes Singapore, uh, which is not a highly probable scenario, even if Greece were to devalue, I mean, leave the euro and sustain a very large depreciation, it is improbable that it will get a boom in economic activity given the, all the other frailties. Um, so, what do I mean by restructuring? I don't mean that, uh, as I highlighted, that everyone will require. Spain is not likely to require a public debt restructuring, neither is Ireland, but senior bank debts, which are in the orders of magnitudes of 100% of GDP. Gross external debt in Ireland is over 1,000% of GDP. Some of that is no doubt double counted because of their external uh, offshore system. But even if it were half that amount, it is, it is an untenable debt burden. So I do not see the advanced economies in Europe getting out of this without restructuring. Uh, in some cases, it will involve private sector restructuring, restructuring of, of uh, bank, senior bank debts, and in others, it will involve some element of public sector restructuring as well, not just Greece, but also Portugal, maybe Italy. I don't know. But the point I am making is that while this subject continues to be taboo in economic circles, policy circles in Europe, uh, it is not unprecedented in the advanced economies and certainly not unprecedented in Europe. If you look at the pre-World War II history of the advanced economies, you find very few countries that didn't have some form of debt conversion, debt restructuring, uh, outright default, or a combination of those things, the United States included. After World War I, no one repaid their debts to the United States, so the concept that the UK never defaulted or that France hasn't defaulted in the last one, that's just not the case. The debt forgiveness after World War I for the, for the UK was close to 20% of GDP, and for France it was actually even higher. The United States in 1933 abrogated the gold clause, which meant that 
if you, if you were holding a treasury bond. That treasury bond was initially payable in dollars. Then after the fact, it came, they came and told you it wasn't payable in dollars, it was payable only in fiat currency. However, the dollar had depreciated 41% against gold. So you got a haircut. The point I am making is it is very difficult. My baseline scenario is that sooner or later, Europe will need some restructuring. What does that mean, though, for the second part of my talk, uh, the third part of my talk on emerging markets? Well, if the current environment is one of dead overhangs in the advanced economies in varying degrees, then the prospect of sustained subpar growth, excess capacity, high unemployment, is going to be with us for some time. Now, you may just jump to the conclusion that's got to be bad news for emerging markets. Not necessarily. With that protracted economic slump, you have a protracted period of very low and stable international interest rates. And I would argue that some of the tendencies that we have seen since the crisis, where we have what, in, what Ernesto described in terms of capital inflows, is nothing other than the very old time immemorial search for yield that we have seen throughout history. Yields are very low. Guillermo, Leo Lederman, and I wrote about this many, many years ago. When you have very low interest rate environment in the advanced economies, the search for yield turns the horizons to emerging markets, which means capital inflows. It means the potential for overheating. And it means that we could run into the roller coaster that we have in the past. So this brings me to the, 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 some of the risks that I'd like to highlight as regards emerging market. Previous speakers have stressed the risks of two scenarios in Europe. One is what I would view as the baseline, which is a muddling through scenario uh, in which the euro survives and Europe continues to delay its necessary adjustment, but there is a bit of restructuring here and a bit of easing there and a bit of financial repression. I'll go back to that later. But it doesn't fall apart. And I agree that the falling apart scenario is bad for everyone, Latin America and emerging markets more broadly included. I'm going to focus on the baseline scenario. In that baseline scenario, however, there are lots of risks for the emerging markets. And a key risk that I'd like to emphasize um, is complacency. The longer the capital inflows and the low interest rate environment persists in the advanced economies, the more it is going to be taken for granted and treated as permanent. And when you start treating a good shock as a permanent shock, the scope for idiocy is infinite. And so the extent of overborrowing the very same things that kept those economies safe during the severe downturn of the fall of 2008 are being reversed. We're seeing current account deficits come back. We're seeing buildups in debt, not so much external debt, but you look at the domestic credit numbers in Brazil and it raises a lot of eyebrows. Ditto for China. China's capital controls are notwithstanding massive real estate boom, massive buildup in domestic debt. You don't need external debt to have a banking crisis. You just need a lot of debt. Even if it's domestic, it's still problematic. So I, I do think that a vulnerability that I'd like to stress and leave you thinking about is that right now we are in that dangerous phase in emerging markets in which this time is different becomes ingrained in, very, in everyone's memory. And, and, and no, no, the, certainly the crises of the 1990s are not likely to be repeated because we're so different now. Uh, and I see that as a real danger. Let me 
in my few minutes that I have, let me turn to my last topic, which brings together the events in the north, that is the debt overhang, the excess capacity, the subpar growth, the muddling through in the north, with the capital inflow problem of the south. And very much, I, uh, Ernesto is right on the mark highlighting that the capital inflow problem is not a blanket phenomenon, it is a phenomenon affecting a subset of those countries in the South. But let me turn to the global scenario. I think with the crisis, we are seeing a break in the paradigm of the global financial architecture. What do I mean in English? I mean that from first the breakdown of Bretton Woods in the early 70s, then the late 70s and early 80s, we saw a wave of liberalization of domestic financial systems and international global integration. That meant that we became once again as globalized as we were before World War I. Because let us remember that capital mobility is something that we here in this room have taken for granted, but it was not always the baseline. It was not always the setting. Between World War II and the late 70s, Capital markets, domestic capital markets, international capital markets were heavily controlled. In the United States, for instance, you couldn't buy gold until the 1970s. Uh, what, uh, where am I going with this? I'm going to one of my favorite pet themes of the return of financial repression. What do I mean? I mean that in a setting in which the advanced economies, this is common sense, this is not as a, when the advanced economies are mired in high levels of debt, the incentive to generate not just low real interest rates, but negative real interest rates is very high. Because what do negative real interest rates do? They erode your debt. Negative real interest rates are nothing other than a tax on the bondholder. It's a, it's a wealth tax of, of sorts. And in that environment, that it's common to the advanced economies, the North is going to have, and this is not a hypothetical, every incentive to keep capital in. What we are seeing is a great return to home bias in investment right now. Greek banks buy Greek debts. Irish banks buy Irish debt. UK banks buy UK debt. There is already in the data a, a, a fairly broad deglobalization underway. Now emerging markets faced with the prospect that capital inflows are big, that they're destabilizing, and that they're persistent, have also reacted by introducing a whole variety of capital account barriers. We are politically correct, so we don't call them capital controls. We call them macroprudential regulation. But that's what they are. And so you have the advanced economies trying to keep capital in, and reduce their debt burdens, public and private, and, capital, and, and, and emerging markets to keep capital out. I am not suggesting that we're going to see the Financial Repression Act of 2012 or 2013. I am not suggesting that. I am saying that after severe crises, and this is not unique to this one, what we see are tendencies for governments to come in and re-regulate. And that is happening in the United States. Their Dodd-Frank is thousands of pages, not hundreds of pages. Uh, and that is happening in various shapes and form in Europe. And with that thought, uh, I would like to leave you thinking that as a student of history, do not use the 1990s, do not use the 2000s as your model of what is likely to emerge in the next 10 years. You have to go back further to an era where many of you, not all of you, uh, where many of you had not been born. Uh, I, of course, had not been born either, but, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, but the, the, in some sense, reversal of globalization, and I think Domingo's point that if the Euro were to break down that the trade implosion would be far more severe than anything that we saw in 2008, 2009 is one to take to heart. Because often when there, the real risk 
as I see it, is that where there's a deglobalization of finance, we're okay as long as a deglobalization of trade doesn't follow suit, which is what happened in the 1930s. And I'll stop on that uplifting note. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Carmen. Fascinating uh, presentation. We have some time for Q and E and A. Uh, and uh, I would like to give a chance to the panelists if they have some pressing comment that they want to make before I open up to uh, the floor for, for comments. I don't sense that this major disagreement among you. You do? You have some, okay. Uh, George. Just uh, briefly, uh, on these scenarios about, and I was going to talk about outlook uh, as uh, seen from uh, East Central Europe. Um, on these scenarios, I beg to, to disagree a little bit, um, some of it on the normative, some of it on the, on the, on the uh, as far as the, uh, the diagnostic is concerned. A, I'm afraid there are some things which this time is different when we talk about the Euro crisis. Um, disintegration or the type of centrifugal forces that you feel in a common currency area has not been felt really in peacetime anywhere or short of major political upheavals. I mean, in the 20th century, we know of, of the, uh, the Austro-Hungarian crown falling apart after the First World War. You had the ruble falling apart, the, the, um, the Yugoslav dinar falling apart, but it was not really for the type of reasons that we see now a, in the Euro crisis. In fact, the political will is very much there to keep it together. So I would really discard a little bit the, the ominous breakup of the, of the Europe, and certainly not with a Grexit, as it's called. A Grexit would, would certainly, for sure, there would be turbulence in the, in the um, uh, foreign exchange markets, but it, it would then go back to some sort of an equilibrium. It's true, we are in a multiple equilibrium type of situation right now, and with the muddling through, um, the, 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 this is sort of a good, a good equilibrium. But beyond that, the scenarios that I see and the normative, particularly from Domingo, the normative type of, of, uh, of, of element here of just do what the Fed does, um, I think we, 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 we couldn't do in Europe, in the Eurozone, it couldn't be done quite as easily. In fact, the Fed is not providing any funding uh, for California or Illinois or anything like that, the usual suspects, for good reason. You don't want to create a uh, moral hazard and, and, free, and, and free loading type of, or free riding type of, of behavior. So I mean, there are some things which are a little bit different. And one more thing, if I may, uh, one more thing which is different, and there have been, uh, there is precedent for very large buildups of debt. True, they were usually associated with wars. Um, uh, that and then afterwards, of course, that could be brought down uh, through very and deleveraging could take place. Today, that part is quite difficult. Okay, we have something that is totally unprecedented in world history. Carmen, you will challenge me, I hope, <laughs> but I think it will be difficult. The type of social entitlements that we have today in Europe, in the U.S., are irreversible. It just cannot happen uh, short of major social upheavals. It's very difficult, really, to do that. And the demographics, the demographic explosion that we have today from both extending life uh, uh, mortality, or rather uh, life expectancy, from above and from below is totally unprecedented. So you bring that together, and then I ask myself, how are we going to really manage doing this? And uh, well, that's, that's a question. I have some answers to that, but I'm not going to go uh, beyond that. that OK, point. let's give a chance to Carmen and Domingo, perhaps, to uh, reply to your comments, if they feel like it, or, or else I will yes. open up to the floor for questions. You know, uh, the Fed didn't purchase uh, debt of California, or because in the United States, the crisis didn't come 
from uh, the debt of the of the states, uh, but the Fed has been purchasing mortgages, uh, junk bonds, and, and and many things that were, are not uh, uh, U.S. Treasury bills. No, so when I say that uh, the ECB should act more like a lender of last resort, uh, I am thinking of uh, the ECB. Um, conducting open market operation using uh, the bonds uh, of uh, all the all the countries and also uh, providing uh, uh, financing uh, uh, to the countries uh, the, the same way as the Fed has been doing uh, extensively uh, uh, directly or indirectly indirectly of, of course to the to the US uh, Treasury um, all the uh, considerations on moral hazard uh, problem, I think that are overstated uh, because, um, you know, the countries that go through this crisis already suffer a lot. And in terms of pushing for the necessary fiscal and uh, regulatory and uh, adjustments, um, uh, um, the fact that they have to to reach at least a, a primary balance, otherwise they would not be able either to to pay um, the salaries at the end of each uh, month, even if they repudiated the debt, um, um, creates the incentive for for the necessary uh, adjustments. No, and but uh, one has to look at the uh, political conditions for the government to be able to introduce the reforms. And in the, in the middle of chaos, and particularly if you give the national governments the possibility of uh, printing their national currencies again to finance uh, disequilibria, like if uh, uh, Greece uh, leaves the uh, the, uh, the exits the uh, the euro uh, will will only facilitate the uh, implement co continuation of of uh, uh, populist policies. Uh, of course, it will be financed uh, through inflation, exactly like it is happening in in Argentina, no, in these days. And so, uh, my point is that. Um, if you look at the balance sheet of the ECB, only after um, uh, pro, uh, pro, uh, Prodi, I'm sorry, uh, replaced uh, um, Jean-Claude Trichet, you see uh, a, a, a catching up in terms of uh, in introducing enough liquidity to the uh, to the Fed, no, and. And I think that uh, once that process of catching up uh, with, with the expansion of liquidity of the Fed, uh, probably we will have a weaker euro, and that will facilitate the adjustment in, in, in Europe. Carmen? Uh, very briefly, uh, well, George, I don't mean to, of course, say that every crisis is identical. Uh, each crisis has its own flavor. However, a common thread across crises and across time is that in the antecedents, you have a massive debt buildup. And in the aftermath, you have a very protracted uh, work down of those debt overhangs. And also, a common feature in that protracted work down of the debt overhang is some sort of reneging on the debt. Now, the reneging process c it can be quite different across episodes. If you think pension funds are sacrosanct, good luck, uh, is all I can say. I, I think uh, pension systems in the advanced economies are one of the most overvalued assets right now uh, relative to what ultimately will be delivered. Don't forget, financial repression is a transfer from savers to borrowers, mm -hmm. and it is an erosion maybe not all at once, but it's an erosion over time 
It is a tax on savers. And right now, you have pension funds that are being taken in France, for example, out of the equity market and placed into government bonds. Um, I would hate to think uh, what, by the time uh, my son retires, what entitlements uh, may look like. So I, I'll leave you with that uplifting thought that I do think um, reneging takes many forms and that uh, pension liabilities are a target. Admito, you want to say something? Or? Um, so I we, know if, if, uh, we are running out of time. We run out of time. So, <laughs> <laughs> so now I, it's, uh, I leave the... We can, have may, the maybe we can... Uh, give me, so give me a chance to ask uh, one question, and maybe there is time for one or two from the floor. Um, as I was wondering, uh, we, we talked a little bit, for my taste, uh, too freely about uh, the evaluation, and in particular, I'm referring to uh, Domingo's uh, uh, comments. When we say that the, the, uh, the when you say that the Euro uh, devaluation can help uh, Europe recover, I mean, you are doing something to the U.S. I mean, are we uh, getting into currency wars? I mean, unless the U.S. is growing fast, uh, that may not be taken um, as, a, as a friendly gesture on the part of, of Europe. That, that's comment number one. I wonder if that would not lead to a complaint about currency manipulation, which this country is very quick on its feet to, to do that, uh, number one. Number two, uh, even if that worked, uh, I'm not sure that it is that easy for the euro to devalue, to make the euro devalue. Super Mario, I'm not sure that he'll be able to, despite his uh, big strength, to devalue. Because look at the case of Switzerland, for example. Uh, when the Swiss uh, franc was started to appreciate uh, too much, the Swiss uh, just started to, they, they accumulated euros. So there is a bit of fear of floating in all of this. Uh, and the rest of the world is not, uh, uh, not going to let this happen without a fight, I suppose. So that's why I'm not really worried about inflation in Europe, because I Potentially, you have a lender of last resort for Europe in Switzerland, in uh, Australia, etc. Right? Uh, and uh, finally, continuing on foreign exchange issues, on uh, Carmen, um, uh, I wonder, uh, you are talking about repression, uh, restructuring, uh, Etc. And um, one of the big holders of of U.S. debt, as as you know, of course, is uh, is China. So if if you start manipulating things in such a way that the real interest rate on U.S. debt uh, becomes uh, sharply negative, that would mean China will start making capital losses. And is that politically sustainable? I mean, that, that's a bit, that's war, in a way. Uh, uh, let me open, let me okay. see if there are a couple of questions from the floor. Short one, shorter than mine. <laughs> uh, well, somehow, I was thinking in terms of what Carlos was referring to, what's the uh, role of, of China uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm humble, and before you, the guys particularly want to have a sense of knowledge of history, but would it be both fair and, and financially sensible for the Chinese to do the war in finance? One more question. Who gives the divide at the front? Oh, please. Uh, uh, identify yourself. I'm sorry. I yeah, I'm Bob Harris. I'm a non-academic. You mentioned uh, hedge fund uh, investing in um, Eastern Europe. Uh, and how extensive is this hedge fund investing in, uh, in Central Europe, uh, Latin American and emerging markets, uh, 
is, there, is it also private equity with mergers and hostile takeovers and this sort of stuff? And uh, does it contribute to the economy? And, uh, and uh, what is the risk uh, to some of these things? Okay. Yes. Uh, As I have to, to rush, because I have to take a train at four, I, I will try to answer. You know, it, when I say that the euro should uh, be devalued through a more expansionary uh, monetary policy, and I say that it could become equal to, to the dollar one to one, uh, I am, uh, my point is, of course, uh, devalue against what? Against all the rest of the, of the currency, either in nominal terms or in real terms. Why, if every, the rest of the country, namely China or Latin America, uh, prevent their currencies to appreciate, uh, of course they will have to admit higher inflation. And uh, in real terms, these currencies in the rest of the world will uh, appreciate because of the uh, higher inflation. Now, that higher inflation will not be seen immediately in Europe and in the United States because of this sluggish economy. But eventually, it will come also into Europe and the United States. But together with very low interest rate, will generate negative interest rate, which is mm -hmm. uh, the form of uh, uh, financial repression or, uh, you know, that uh, Carmen predicts that will uh, actually happen. And, um, when I see that Ben Bernanke continues saying that the, uh, they target 2% inflation, while other people say, no, actually the target, the inflation should be 4%, uh, so uh, there will be negative rate. I think that my view is that Ben Bernanke cannot say that uh, the, the target is 4%, but in practice, uh, the US is implementing a monetary policy that eventually will generate a four percent rather than two percent uh, annual inflation now, uh, with interest rates close to zero negative interest rates will work uh, uh, of course that is a problem for the future there will be a volcker coming back sometime in the future to restore uh, price stability no uh, before continuing with the answers uh professor padma desai has a question uh, i just want to continue with uh, uh valor's comment uh, Capital inflows from advanced economies, low interest rate, to uh, emerging market economies at various uh, rates has, of course, led to inflation in these recipient countries, real appreciation of their currencies. And I want to remind you of a comment which uh, Ben Bernanke, Chairman of the Federal Reserve, made in one international meeting, saying, Oh, you are all complaining about real appreciation of your currencies? Let it be. Uh, uh, your exports will suffer, manufacturing will exports, but uh, that is the way implicitly we didn't say that. We said, okay, your currencies are appreciating in real terms, but uh, don't blame us. We're going to continue doing what we are doing here at this time. That means the Chinese representative walked out. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Carmen? Well, um, I, uh, two questions on, on China and one, they're both also on exchange rate issues, so let me start with Guillermo. Um, Guillermo, um, my view is importantly shaped by our work together on fear of floating. So my view of why the Chinese hold reserves is not based on their desire to earn a certain rate of return, uh, but their important domestic uh, policy objective of keeping uh, the exchange rate, uh, the nominal exchange rate fixed. And so what am I saying? I am saying that uh, I don't see, there are scenarios out there that I say, well, okay, at some point there's going to be this massive sell-off of, of treasury debt. I don't buy that scenario because a, dif a different way of describing that scenario is saying, okay, at some point the Chinese are really going to tolerate a massive appreciation of their currency in a very short period of time, something they're very afraid of. 
So I think there is going to be a tolerance to negative rates of return uh, if you balance it against their other uh, uh, objectives. Uh, the gentleman's question, uh, which also addresses China, but uh, on a longer term horizon, I do think the next reserve currency uh, is likely to be the emergence of the renminbi as a reserve currency. And I would like to remind everyone that reserve currencies are not born overnight. They emerge. The United States uh, began having international debt. Other countries starting to peg to the dollar and issue domestic dollar debt in the 1880s. And it really did not emerge as a dominant currency until after World War I. It's, not, it's a gradual unfolding process. Um, unless something, of course, you know, were to devastate the U.S. economy, you know, it's what, what I'm getting at is for an extended period, the dollar and the British pound coexisted as reserve. I think we're heading in that direction. Yeah. And what we're seeing already is that emerging markets that are trading a lot with China in goods and services are also beginning to rely more on China for finance, mm -hmm. which is a precursor. Of, gain, of, 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 an in, of an increased role as a reserve currency. Um, and, and I just want to make a brief comment on, on um, the issue of currency wars and Guillermo's question to, to, to Domingo. And I, I basically, I think, if I understand what Domingo's saying, well, I completely agree with him. I think we're, right now, if, you know, Bernanke cannot say this, certainly Mario Draghi can't say this, but among the lesser evil would be an inflation rate that goes from two to four. Uh, and actually, when I say lesser evil, actually it would be a welcome reprieve. And so that it, unless one really starts to target a particular exchange rate level, I think just more accommodation uh, is going to you know, be the path to more depreciation uh, of the euro and perhaps more depreciation of the dollar little by little, if not in nominal terms relative to currencies that are pegged like the uh, uh, yuan renminbi, uh, but over time through uh, real depreciation. Okay. Um, Ernesto, I'll give you the last word. Okay. Just a few a few thoughts on, on many very interesting comments that appeared. Carmen said she is a half-empty type. Uh, I think that's the obligation of policymakers to be responsible for the policymakers to be the half-empty type. But you can be very optimistic and positive on your individual life. But when you are dealing with public policy issues, you always have to think what is the worst case scenario and be prepared for it. So, uh, uh, and I know Kamar personally and she is a very optimistic and humorous person. So you are not being fair to you when you say you are a half empty type. You are being a responsible policymaker. Um, the other thing on the half empty, one comment. Um, we tend to very rapidly forget the political dynamics that the euro zone crisis is creating very quickly. We were having a meeting two days ago with a Greek, former Greek minister at Brookings. And today, the Greek polling numbers look this way. 34% uh, of the electorate is prepared to vote for the extreme left. 14% of the electorate for the neo-Nazi Golden Dawn. So 50% of the electorate already is prepared to vote for very extreme parties. And actually, the traditional parties have collapsed. Uh, 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 the PASOK went from 44% to 5%. And this is very similar to what happened in Uruguay and Argentina, where very, very well-established parties were destroyed after this uh, uh, economic collapse. 
and basically condemn to disappearance. The Unión Cívica Radical in, 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 in Argentina and the Partido Colorado in Uruguay. So, I mean, we do not have that much time. That's all I want to say. When you see this in Greece and the Catalonia trying to secede from Spain. Um, uh, the third and, and, and last comment I would like to make has to do with uh, this uh, comment by Carmen, which I could not agree more, and I just want to emphasize, about these cycles of overborrowing in which we tend to pass the, como se dice pasar la posta? To pass the, the, alguien sabe en inglés como es pasar la posta? To pass the, the, the torch, I mean, you know, whatever, yes. from one to the other. So, we had a cycle of overborrowing in advanced economies that ended up in the crisis that we now have. Now this crisis has created, in my opinion, and here we have a small subtle difference with, with Carmen, this has to do a lot with the saving rate, not with the liquidity, in the sense that I think that central banks in the US the central bank in the U.S. essentially avoided the destruction of liquidity, did not create new liquidity. But I might be wrong, but the, 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 the end result is exactly the same. So we have this cycle of overborrowing, ended up in a crisis. The crisis now, for whatever reason, creates this new and humongous amount of liquidity that is going to emerging economies creating the risk of a cycle of overborrowing, which we are seeing very clearly. In fact, we are seeing it through the type of flows that we are seeing. In Latin America, before the crisis, two-thirds of the flows were FDI. Now, two-thirds of the flows are non-FDI flows. So it's basically we went from FDI to hot money, and the search for yield hypothesis becomes a very relevant one. Okay? So this is very easily reversible money. So I agree with that. You look at the fis any, any type of policy. We look very closely at the fiscal policies. It has, has been humongously procyclical. We spent away not only the boom, but even more than the boom. So the cycle of overborrowing is effectively to this subset of countries that were yes, the, the target of, of these new inflows is starting to, to grow up again in many of our countries and might end up in tears as you So my, my, my question would be, and I'll leave this as an open question. If this is the way the world capital market works, I mean, do we really want financial globalization in this way? Uh, or financial globalization in the way it works might compromise the globalization that we do not want to go away, which is the trade globalization. Just put it on the table Great for question further discussion. For the next seminar. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>